You're watching KLTX, Channel 15, serving the city of Lufkin. Welcome to the July edition of Forest Country Gardening. My name is Elaine Cameron and I'm an Angelina County Master Gardener. I'd like to welcome fellow Master Gardener Marlo Schubert to our show. Thank you, Elaine, for having me. I'm honored. Good. In fact, Marlo and I were in the same Master Gardener class right. in 2002. And thank you for inviting us to your home today. Thank you. We're delighted that you would come do a show on us. And we're going to talk to Marlo today about the benefits of raised bed gardens. And Marlo has a beautiful place out here. Would you show us your gardens, Marlo? I'd be glad to show you and have you look. So Marlo, we're here today at your place um, to talk about raised beds. Okay. Can you tell us why you have your gardens in raised beds out here? Well, it started a long time ago. I started using the soil that's here, but my soil is not not any good it's called post oak dirt and uh, so with that said i had read about raised beds and i decided to try it and i started out with two by sixes but the sun warps those things so i had to do something and go with something better uh -huh, uh -huh. so okay. i started uh, after the two by sixes i went with landscape timbers and landscape timbers rot after three to five years and there's nothing left. So when I found that out, I had to do away with all the landscape timbers and I went back with different types of concrete edging. Okay. With a raised bed, you can control what you put in it. Uh, and mostly what this is, you're gonna see is uh, a composted pine bark that's been uh, composted and I, I get mine by the trailer load mm -hmm. because I use so much. But that's what you see in all these beds, almost uh -huh. this ground up pine bark that's composted and I till it in so I get a little bit of soil with it. It yeah, breaks it down and you have to add to it after a year or two, which actually is good uh -huh. because you're adding new compost to the old right. and it keeps your soil improve, right. keeps improving. Right. And then you have the idea where your soil is loose where Dr. Misabney, I know, told us that the ideal is if you could just dig in your garden with your hands, if, if, it's, if it's conditioned right. That is called tilth. In fact, one of our master gardeners was out here one day, and he just stuck his hand down at it almost to his elbow. <laughs> and uh, so this is, uh, uh, you, can, you can work it with a little fork, or you can work it. I use a mini tiller uh -huh. when I empty a portion of the beds. Right. Uh, you never need a big tiller, uh, and you can work it strictly with a mini tiller or with a fork. I mean, you can work with hand tools, and I yes. have, to have a lot of equipment. That's yes. what I like about my raised beds. I can do everything with hand tools. You, that, you can do this. I, I will weed. You can pull weeds up. They're, they're very easy to pull up what weeds come up. Uh -huh. um, actually, I, I'm sure the seeds blow in because there's no seeds in there. But but you can just, they normally will just pull out. Mm -hmm. So they're very easy. And then the soil is loose for the roots to grow and yes. get their oxygen and their water and all the things that they need. They're the soil is very, very loose and it's, uh, it's aerated simply because it's so loose. And as the, the bark breaks down, of course, it, it's adding humus to the soil. So it just keeps improving over the right. years. And what do you do with fertilizer? How do you feed them? Well, uh, actually, I don't have a set time other than things like blackberries. The blackberries, I feed them in the spring when they first start putting out their new growth. My daily list, I will feed them uh, in the early around February and then late, maybe August, I may give them another feeding. And mm -hmm. I just use regular fertilizer or in the case I'm using and trying a new one out, which is composted chicken fertilized that's uh -huh. produced by a company in Center, Texas. Okay. And so your roses, 
You feed them on a regular basis or? I feed them like I do other things. I will feed them once or twice a year. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. that's basically all they need. Right. So actually, raised bed saves you a lot of work. Tilling, heavy duty digging, yeah, and even putting them in pine bark, they have a lot of the nutrients they already need. They have a lot of the nutrients that they already need. And uh, like you said, they you can just work. It's just so easy to work. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it's just, uh, it, it's the only way to go as far right. as I'm concerned. Right, and we're standing in front of a lovely bed of red knockout roses. Red knockout roses. And these are, I believe, next to us, I think you said were Julia Child? These are the Julia Child. Beautiful. And uh, they are a butter yellow and smell wonderful. Mm, I'm going to try that out. They're wonderful. I love a scented rose. I often think if it, a rose doesn't have a scent, <laughs> <laughs> Why bother? <laughs> that's that's well, what I that's, like. That's kind of how I feel. Most of your knockouts have very little fragrance. Right. But the Julia Child, it is. Uh, it smells good and just. It's almost as good as the knockouts. It just right. blooms and blooms almost year round. And being in Texas, we need a yellow rose, don't we? Oh, we ab absolutely. Do. We've got to have the yellow rose of Texas. And that's what right. better one than the Julia Child? Right. Now your materials here. You have. Uh, I think they're called retaining wall blocks. Is that the name of them? This is yes. the retaining wall blocks. Uh, we put these in. They've been here for several years. The good thing I like about these, once you put them there, they're there until you move them, basically, I guess. Mine are too high, which means uh, these are 4 by 12 uh, by 8 which means they're four inches thick and 12 inches wide, uh -huh. and that gives me an eight inch raised bed. And which is about perfect, doesn't it? Which is about perfect. Most of your plant roots are not gonna go a whole lot deeper than eight inches, right. so right. that's plenty. And then even when you condition the soil by putting all that on top, even the native soil, I think, becomes accessible to your The plants. native soil yeah. is accessible. If I wanted to, I could take my mini-tiller and just till, and it, it would go through that uh -huh. and uh, would bring up some of the native soil, which would uh -huh. give me a little bit of soil with my... With your mix. With my mix, uh -huh. yes. Okay. Here we are at your daylily beds, and I noticed you are using a different material for your raised beds here. Can you tell us about those blocks? Yes, these are the first ones that I used, uh, the concrete blocks. These are four by four by 12s, which also stack together. They're too high. This also gives me the eight inch raised beds. Mm -hmm. But I started out using these because they were readily available and uh, I liked them. Uh, also, I caught them on sale. And the price is right on these, yes. isn't it? Yes. Yeah, right, so right. I started with these, uh -huh. uh, and then I graduated to the wall retainers later. Uh-huh. Uh, and they're, they're all concrete, but uh, they are just a different shape is the only difference in them. Right. And you originally, you held them together with something called liquid nails? We put them together with liquid nails. I have found that over the years, liquid nails will finally break down. Mm -hmm. And so we have gone to the regular glue for concrete blocks. Great, okay. And you'll notice if you look at these beds, uh, they're laid out in a curve, which makes them very attractive. So you said you took a hose and made a design, is that right? I took a water hose and laid it out the shape that I wanted it, and then we followed the contour of the hose. Uh, is the way we made this was our first bed uh, and so we did this and then the others I just followed the contour right. of that first bed that's why they're curved I had seen a picture of that in a magazine and so I did that and I uh, laid that water hose out and did it that way mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful and this these are your prize day lilies this is some of my prize day lilies we uh, probably have three or four thousand now Mm -hmm. uh, total. Mm -hmm. uh, but these, uh, some of these are mine that I've hybridized. Most of them are uh, daylilies that I bought before I really got into the business. And there's a special one over here, I believe. Uh, there is a special one over here. With a special name. And it is, uh, it's named Gigi's Love, which is after my wife. Her nickname has been Gigi since she was a little girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, so being the first day lily that I wanted to hybridize, I named this after uh, my wife. Her name is Ada Lee, 
but she goes by Gigi uh -huh. been since she was a little girl. They're beautiful. So Gorgeous. that's named after her. It well, just blooms and blooms and blooms. Well, how cool to have a flower named after her. That's great. That's great. And when you hybridized. It's one that I hybridized. And watering. How do you water your day lilies, Marlo? Most of them, almost all, uh, the entire watering that I do, I do by hand. I hold mm -hmm. a water hose and go up and down every bed Mm -hmm. and water them that way. Do you do it in the morning, the evening? How do you I do, do it, it when I have time. Okay. <laughs> and do you, do you uh, water the base of the plants or does it matter with daily? I water the base of the plant. Uh, uh -huh. if, if, if they need to, I will rinse the top off. They've got dust on them now where I, we weed eat it mm -hmm. and slung dirt on them. So if I were to water them now, they do not need water since mm -hmm. we got the three inches of rain Sunday. Mm -hmm. But if I were to water them now, I would water them from the top down just simply to... And if you have a bad, bad drought like we did in 2011, I would also water the top of them then to, oh. to keep them hydrated. Because they can absorb water through their leaves. Yes, the they can, can. They can right. absorb water through their leaves. And your pathways are so neat. How do you keep them neat looking and weed free do you have landscape cloth or actually what we do we just we just weed it in okay and, and keep them they look nice uh, it looks neat uh but enjoyable to walk in yeah that's right that's right and the, under the live oak tree you have leaves in the pathway which is a good way it, to uh, it's also a, makes a nice pathway uh for walking and and viewing this is bronze fennel and i have had it for years it is a perennial, it comes back every year, but the reason I grow it, it is a host plant for the black, big black swallowtail butterfly. Uh, almost every year, I will have larva on this, on these plants, uh, and uh, if I can keep the wasp away from them, they do really, really good, but this is, that's why I grow it, it's the host for the black, black swallowtail butterfly. And it has a beautiful fragrance, it smells a little bit like licorice, and and people do cook with the bulbs. It the is a herb and that people use to cook with. Uh, we have not used it for that. I just simply grow it for the butterflies. Uh, for the butterflies, right? And these beds, your vegetable beds, are edged with a different. Uh, it's the half concrete block. Is that okay. a good name for it? Is there another name? These are called cinder blocks, I think, normally. Okay. okay. These particular ones are four by eight by sixteen. Mm -hmm. Uh, they do make a eight by eight by 16, uh, but I went with the four because I didn't have room. It would have taken too much of my uh, walkway in the middle sure. for the extra four inches on each side. Sure. So I went with a four by eight by 16, mm -hmm. and uh, then I capped them off with the uh, two by eight by 16 right. cap. This bed's yes, Yes, that, that keeps the weeds from growing up in those holes in the concrete, but it also makes for a, a much more uh, aesthetic look. The con sure. it's, it's mainly for common. That makes these beds about 10 inches tall rather than eight inches. Gives you more room. Now, did you um, dig a hole to put those in or a trench or are they basically on top no, of the soil? No, I just, I just leveled them as we went uh, with a tiny, tiny hand rake that I have. Uh -huh. And we uh, laid the two end pieces, the way you do this, laid the two end blocks and then stretch a string from one end to the other and that string is your guide. You line it up with that string and you're gonna have a level Great. Uh, border. Good, good. And let's see, we're talking about blackberries next, I believe. We have the Apache and oh. Arapaho? I have the Apaches on this end. I have the Arapahoes in the center. And then I have the new Washita's on the far end down there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Apaches came in first this year, which is a little bit unusual. Normally they're behind the Arapahoes, mm -hmm. but they came in first this year. And these are about done. The, uh, the Washita's on the far end are really just doing really good. Now they have done extremely well this year. So we've got, uh, berries for a lot of cobblers. That's great. And these berries, I believe, were developed at the University of Arkansas? All, th uh, and all three of these were developed at the University of Arkansas. And the good thing about them, they are thornless. So they you, have no you, thorns. You can pick berries without getting scratched. And Absolutely. When I had the, the old brasses, and when these came out, I dug the brasses up and put them on the burn pile <laughs> and went with these. One lady that grows commercial Barry, she said those things will jump three feet just to get you. 
Yeah, true, true. So pruning, tell me about pruning these. You have these. Okay, blackberries, okay, these that produce fruit this year, mm -hmm. they will die. They will, they will never, they only produce one year. Okay. These that you see here, uh -huh. these are the new canes. They will be next year's crop. Now, once these uh, are through, uh, she's through picking the berries this year, I'll cut these off. These that are growing up this way, the new ones, I try to keep them about four foot tall. Uh -huh. The reason you cut them off is once you cut them off, they will produce lateral branches, which will give you more fruit in, oh. when they begin fruiting. And it also, they will not get up and fall over either. Uh -huh. Great. And we were noticing you have pie pans and a hat and strings. Can you tell us about all of that? I, yeah, I'd be glad to. The Malkin birds love blackberries. It's hard to keep them out of them. So a f number of years ago, I had coons got into my corn one time. They only got one stalk. But I, I stretch a string about two to three foot tall, and then I go back and I, I do it just like you would a trot line, only I use the aluminum pie pans mm -hmm. rather than hooks. And any time there's any kind of breeze or anything, that, that pie pan's going to flutter and it reflects. I've never had any problem with coons uh, getting in. And this year, it's pretty well kept the, the birds out of the blackberries. We've got a lot of blackberries this year and still have quite a few more to go. Tell us about this beautiful vine that's flowering. This is an evergreen wisteria. I saw these in Nacogdoches years ago. Uh, and they were draped over a tall wall, and these blooms is what I saw, and uh, they smelled so good. It's kind of funny, I, I went back and got a lot of cuttings, and I didn't get a one of them to take. So when I saw these, I got uh, four of them. They will, they will be moved to my pergola, where they hopefully will cover it up. Mm -hmm. But they're supposed to bloom in the fall. This one bloom, these bloom almost all summer. They're gorgeous. So smell wonderful. They they do smell good. Mm -hmm. And these are your pride, I believe. These the are hydrangeas. The endless summer hydrangea that uh, I put here a few years ago, mm -hmm. and they're on the east side of the house. They get morning sun, and uh, I love hydrangeas. I, gorgeous. Yes. And, and these, uh, of course, they're pink. If you want them to change, change the blue, make this, add some aluminum sulfate, mm -hmm. uh, and the soil will become acidic, and then the colors will change uh, to blue. Uh, so if it's acid soil, they're going to be blue flowers. If it's uh, alkaline soil, they're going to be pink flowers. And if you get it kind of uh, half and half, you're going to have the same different colored blooms on the same plants. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. The pink is a beautiful color. I, I love, I just love, my mother used to have hydrangeas, so. So you have the perfect little spot where they, they get the morning sun and then they get shade. They, and they, they're shaded and they're in the afternoon, right. And they're happy. Remember, hydro in French means water. That's right. They take a lot of water. So you uh, water them frequently. Yes. Uh, if it does not rain, I'll have to water them probably twice a week anyway. Mm -hmm. so tell us about your citrus trees. Well, I, I, just, I just love growing them, and I've always wanted to grow citrus. Of course, we live in a zone where they normally will not make it through the winter, so I have to put them in the greenhouse. That's why I have them in these big pots. What you see, these two here, are ponderosa lemons, and this one and that one over there, they are my, the improved Meyer lemons, and this one right here is the real red grapefruit. Uh, Normally, I will have enough lemons that I can just give them away and give them away. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the grapefruit. Now, the grapefruit has not bloomed this year for some reason. This is a plant that a lady in our church started from seed. We don't know what it's going to oh, be, if it ever so does good. anything. But you can see it, possibly some of the lemons on the Ponderosa. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, they will have anywhere from 8 to 14 on them. Uh, that's all they can really support. 
and I found out that normally what they cannot support, they will abort them. They'll 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 drop them. So you don't need to worry about you don't need to worry about them reducing. unless you've got two or three in one cluster. Uh huh. Uh, then I will when they get so big I won't because they are so heavy mm -hmm. uh, that they'll break the limbs. So I will cut one or two off and leave single one on them because they get so. I did have one limb that I left two on last year and it supported them and I got two big lemons off of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Normally, one of the ponderosa lemons, uh, my wife can get a uh, at least one pie out of the juice out of one of them. So yeah. they they do make a lot of juice, but I just enjoy growing them. They are they're nice. How often do you water these pots? About if it's hot and dry, I need to water them every week, uh -huh. uh, or possibly even more. Uh -huh. Also, I have been asked how to fertilize, and, and this is what I do. Mm -hmm. I do have some regular, I buy some sometimes, but most of the time, I will feed these with uh, Super Bloom. Mm -hmm. uh, it has worked very well for me. And uh, somebody asked me, do you keep doing it when they got fruit? Yes, I do, mm -hmm. up until, because the middle number is what goes into the blooming and the fruiting. Right. So I just keep, I, I will feed them. Uh, I hadn't watered these. I will bring a little water pot out and water them and put about a, a gallon on each one when I water them because it's going to run out the bottom and they're also going to leach out. So you do have to feed them more often. Right. They, they are a heavy feeder. Yeah, I, I grow citrus at home, a lot of satsuma because I leave mine out. I don't have a greenhouse. But the satsuma are rated. They will take a little bit of frost. And what I did find in the summer, I put a heavy layer of pine straw and that really cuts down on your watering it's amazing how it re helps them retain the water it really does and what you can't tell it now because it's about gone but what i put on here i have a, a chipper shredder uh -huh. and i put shredded leaves on top of these and shredded pine straw I might add i right. ran some pine straw through that shredder and boy it's uh, it makes a tremendous amount of difference it also keeps the weeds and stuff out sure uh, but it's it's amazing uh what what that moss will do and and of course it just breaks down and feeds the plant as it as it decomposes right and we talk about mulch for beds but i think sometimes people forget about mulching pots but it really does make a difference in the hot hot summer it does and you're looking at black pots and of course black absorbs heat mm -hmm. much more readily now these are getting pretty good bit of shade now but the sun's going to go over and they're going to be in the afternoon sun right and they've got to have sun to produce but if you can keep them out of that all day hot sun it's going to help them now marlo i notice you have a large dolly here can you tell us about that my wife bought me that dolly. Uh, I have a little one, but these pots are so big that uh, that little one was all I could do to move it because the, the, the shelf on it is too small. So she bought me this one, and then a, a guy that did some work, he said, let me take it, and he went and welded a, the big plate oh. that you see on there. So the hardest part of this is is tilting that pot back because they are heavy. Right. That's a big pot. and. Uh, so she made me that, and it's 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 been a a tremendous labor saver there. And you planned well because your your citrus patio is right adjacent to your greenhouse. Greenhouse, and I also have a a ramp going into my greenhouse. That uh -huh. when we built it, uh, we had that because the man that mainly built it knew that I did this. So he said, "We'll put you a ramp there, Good. so I I can get it in." So we can raise citrus here in. East Texas. You can raise citrus, and if you want one tree, now I know some folks that did this, and they, they I don't know how many, they had had that ponderosa lemon since mm -hmm. 1964, they said, had, which was about 30 years. And what they did, they built a little frame around that mm -hmm. tree, and it, they never moved it. It was in the ground, and they had a little, well, I'm sorry to use it like this, looked like an old outhouse, except it was covered in plastic. Uh -huh. And they had one big light bulb uh -huh. in, in that thing. And when it was cold, they would turn that light bulb on and it had a door on it. And they would uh, open that door on the days. And of course, most days in our winters here, you can open that door. Right. And it's, but every year we would drive by there. It was up in between uh, Henderson and uh, Carthage. Uh -huh. And every year that thing would be loaded. Yeah, So it was happy. Okay, well, thank you. 
Well, Marlo, thank you for asking us out to see your garden today. Thank you for coming. Mark your calendar for these upcoming horticulture events. Angelina Master Gardener's noon program on Tuesday, July 16, 12 noon until 1 p.m. Topic will be aquaponics presented by Wes Caps, a Hudson High School educator who leads students to produce a fish and plant-based interdependent system of food production. Admission is free and you may bring your lunch. Fall Vegetable Gardens will be the topic of Angelina Master Gardener's noon program on Tuesday, August 20, noon until 1 p.m. Dr. Joe Masomni, Texas AgriLife Fruit and Vegetable Specialist, will be the speaker. Admission is free and you may bring your lunch. Angelina Master Gardener's Fall Native Plant Sale will be held on Saturday, September 28, beginning at 8 a.m. at the Master Gardener's Greenhouse in the Farmer's Market. We will offer native bulbs, grasses, perennials, shrubs, trees, and vines. Edible selections will include citrus, native fruit trees, and herbs. Proceeds fund scholarships and educational projects of the Master Gardeners. Plant lists will be posted on Angelina County Master Gardener Facebook page in late September. Do you have any gardening questions you'd like answered? Feel free to send them to me at the email address on your screen, and I'll address them on a future show. And this concludes the July edition of Forest Country Gardening. Until next time, this is Elaine Cameron wishing you happy gardening. <music>